Hi, and welcome to uh, week two of this course on Marxist philosophy. Last week was kind of an introduction to uh, Marxist philosophy and materialism, and this week we're going to continue on the theme of materialism. And we're going to go into more detail in onto the arguments of, of both materialism and idealism, which is the opposite of materialism. Now, last week we ended on the strange persistence of idealism as a philosophy in this age of you know scientific discovery when so much has been revealed about the natural world by science we still nevertheless find that idealist philosophies that is philosophies that assert that either the material world does not exist or we cannot know anything about it uh, these are these forms of philosophy not only persist but if anything have actually gained in strength in fact, the 20th century saw, you could describe a kind of counterattack by idealism. Really, 20th, 20th century philosophy was dominated by uh, idealism in, in different forms, um, more so than I would say the 19th century. And we had, for example, at the beginning of the century, um, the school of thought known as logical positivism, uh, which declared that any statement is meaningless if it is not direct, if it does not directly refer to personal experience. So it is meaningless for me to talk about the Second World War because I obviously didn't experience it, for example. And it just ruled out vast, vast swathes of science as completely meaningless as a result. For them, we cannot know anything beyond our immediate experience as an individual. And therefore, to be honest, real knowledge is ruled out. Most of the knowledge of humanity is essentially uh, ruled out. We also had a very similar train of thought uh, with the Imperio Criticism School, which Lenin criticised in his famous book, Materialism and Imperio Criticism. Uh, and this was a very similar set of ideas, essentially, uh, which basically denied that we can even refer to a world of objective, ob of objective truth and, and uh, natural things, the material world independent of our own thoughts. Um, and then we also had phenomenology and existentialism, which again started out from uh, the analysis of the individual subject, the thinking individual, and everything was described in relation to how they perceive the world rather than the world itself and how that is or how society is. Um, and for, for all of these schools, really, they have no interest in talking about an independent reality. For them, an independent reality is, is essentially meaningless. It's impossible to know anything about. Uh, and then we had, after the Second World War, postmodernism. And postmodernism essentially is quite different in its sort of style, I suppose, to the earlier philosophies, but it's actually very similar in content. And what it argues essentially is that uh, all human knowledge is subjective all human knowledge and, and, and society as a whole really is created by language, essentially, by the way that we talk about things. Uh, there is no objective truth or possibility of objective truth. Uh, science, for example, is defined as simply a set of, you know, practices of ways of talking about things dependent on this or that culture um, and does not refer to any independent facts of the real world that can be verified. Uh, in fact, for them, truth is really what they would say socially constructed. In other words, there is no objective truth. It's just the relative truths of different cultures and different societies. Um, and there's no ability to determine which one is correct and which one isn't. Um, and, and so these are really the main schools of thought, really, of 20th century philosophy. And all of them, in one way or another, are idealist. Um, now... I haven't yet, we haven't yet discussed formal logic, which is, uh, you know, something else that Marxism criticises. Um, but it's worth pointing out that most of these um, mistakes in philosophy, in idealist philosophy, do stem at least, or can be partly explained by the way in which they start from a formal logical point of view. That is to say, a point of view which denies in a sense, relations between things, which isolates and atomizes and categorizes things. We'll come on to discuss formal logic in a later week. Um, in fact, I believe it's what we're discussing next week. But anyway, the the and the reason for this um, is that uh, f for them, um, 
they start out from the the isolated human individual, the thinking individual as well, not the living practical individual in society, in in work or anything like that. Just the sort of abstract individual who thinks somehow. And then they start out by saying, well, how can this person have real knowledge of the real world? Uh, and for them, really, that it proves to be impossible. And um, there's no way of resolving that question. And as Marx explained in the thesis on Feuerbach, of course, it's impossible because you set up the question in a fundamentally scholastic way, as he puts it, uh, in an impractical way, in a way in which assumes from the outset the fundamental difference and unrelatedness of human thought and the material world. He says in the thesis on Feuerbach, he says, the question whether objective truth can be attributed to human thinking is not a question of theory, but is a practical question. Man must prove the truth, i.e. the reality and power, the this-sidedness of his thinking in practice. The dispute over the reality or non-reality of thinking that is isolated from practice is a purely scholastic question. I think that that really puts it brilliantly. And and, uh, he doesn't attempt to disprove it in a kind of circuitous, tortuous kind of logical analysis or anything like that. He merely points out that this this outlook is fundamentally redundant. It has nothing to do with real human life, which is not composed of atomized individuals who don't do anything, but is composed of real practical individuals who need to survive. And that ultimately is the way in which we prove whether or not an an idea is correct or not. It's by the practical application of it. Uh, And of course, there are a number of things that flow from this, which we'll discuss in later weeks, like the fact that humanity is a natural um, or is part of nature, is not separated from nature. We'll discuss that later on. Um, so the outlook of, the, of, of these idealists is kind of, it's like almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You start out from an atomized individual and you attempt to examine their thought as an atomized individual, as if all of these ideas have just popped into their head out of nowhere. And then you conclude it's impossible to see how their ideas can relate to the material world and the things that they do in it. But of course, if you start out in that completely abstract way, then you will never be able to solve the problem. I'll just give a quotation, uh, a couple of quotations actually, that I think really reveal this this sort of formal logical starting point, the very atomistic, atomized rather, uh, starting point of these philosophers and why it makes it impossible for them to explain how we can have objective knowledge. Berkeley, or Bishop Berkeley, who was a uh, a very important idealist um, in the uh, in the eighteenth century, uh, wrote um, the following. He said, "But say you, though the ideas themselves do not exist without the mind, yet there may be things like them, whereof they are copies or resemblances, which things exist without the mind in an unthinking substance." I answer. An idea can be like nothing but an idea. A colour or figure can be like nothing but a colour or figure. You can see very clearly there the way he he defines an advanced thought and the material world is fundamentally different. And then it's like, well, how can they, how can thought possibly relate to, or how, you know, how can it have objective knowledge of of, of things other than itself? David Hume, uh, also uh, uh, an enormous figure in in philosophy, debates, some people would say he's not an idealist. I would say he is essentially an idealist. Um, Anyway, David Hume said the following, he says, the mind has never anything present to it but the perceptions and cannot possibly reach any experience of their connection with objects. This supposition of such a connection is, therefore, without any foundation in reasoning. In other words, again, uh, the mind just is defined in advance as, as not being able, as just being fundamentally different in substance from from the material world, and therefore, of course, it cannot possibly know the material world as it is in itself. Um, as Lenin explained in response to this in in his book that I've already mentioned, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, for this outlook. Uh, our sensations, which is how they say we have knowledge, or rather they say we don't have knowledge, um, our sensations are um, a barrier uh, between two unrelated worlds, you know, the world of the the objective world and the world of our own subjective experience. And the sensations are a barrier, basically. There's this, the fact that we have sensations does not give us knowledge of the objective external world because sensations are part of the mind. They are part of consciousness. 
Uh, whereas for Lenin and, and for, for Marxists and materialists, uh, sensations are are a bridge between, not between two fundamentally different worlds, but between two parts of the same world, because we are ourselves objective, material or natural beings. And the sensations are, are a bridge between these different parts of the same world, therefore. Um, and I would say that the, the main schools of 20th century philosophy, which we've already mentioned, are really rehashings of all of these uh, ideas. They don't really add anything in the philosophical sense to these arguments. Um, now, <clears throat> let's examine in a little bit more detail some of the arguments of these idealists, some of the most important arguments. Uh, for Hume and Kant, who are, again, towering figures in idealist philosophy, and they had some differences, but a lot of similarities, um, they both kind of came to the conclusion that our ideas are, um, are abstract things, you know, um, and we don't experience abstract things, you know. The concrete experience that we have, you know, of tables and chairs or whatever it is in the, in the material world, are, are not abstract. These are concrete, specific objects that are different to different objects. Um, and yet yeah, they concluded that knowledge really consists of these abstract concepts like time and space and cause and effect and things like that. Uh, without those abstract concepts, we don't have any ideas about anything really. So for them, the fact that we don't experience time and space as such, uh, but we use time and space to make sense of the world, shows that we never know the world as it really is, uh, shorn of these abstract concepts like time and space. Um, and we're sort of like wearing kind of goggles, if you like, through which we see the world. Um, uh, but uh, the best answer to this not, comes not necessarily directly from Marx and Engels, but actually from Hegel, who himself was an idealist, but of, of a very different kind. And he thought that it is possible to have objective knowledge uh, of things outside of oneself. And uh, he explained it uh, brilliantly. Um, he said uh, that, well, so just to go back a sec, Kant's main, Kant is very famous for saying that because of these, these the, the fact that our knowledge is, is, consists of abstract categories like time, uh, cause and effect, space, etc. Um, he said that we can never know the thing in itself. We can never know how the real object actually is outside of these concepts, uh, which of course it doesn't have, right? The, the concept, the, the object itself is not time. Um, and so we cannot know what it is like without the concept of time applied to it, as it really is in itself, as he put it. Um, but what Hegel pointed out quite brilliantly uh, is that the thing in itself that Kant talks about is, is absolutely nothing, actually. It's devoid of any content. Uh, and I quote, he says, the thing in itself expresses the object inasmuch as abstraction is made of all that it is for consciousness, of all determinations of feeling, as well as all the te all determination all determinate thoughts about it. It is easy to see what is left, namely, what is completely abstract or totally empty and determined only as what is beyond. It is itself only the product of thinking and precisely of the thinking that has gone to the extreme of pure abstraction, the product of the empty I, as in me, that makes its own empty self-identity into its object. Now, apologies for the kind of the, the language of Hegel, which sometimes is very hard to understand. What he's saying essentially is that if you define something as a thing in itself, removed from all of these determinate qualities like time and space, cause and effect, yellow, black, whatever colour you ascribe to it. If you'd say, well, these are abstract concepts that are, belong to my mind and they don't exist in the objective world, um, then if you do that and then you say, well, then the thing in itself is, is somehow exists out there and I cannot know what it's like because I always apply these ideas to it. You're defining the thing in itself as devoid of any content, as nothing, because if something is without any determination, be it hard or soft, yellow or brown or in time and space, then it is really nothing. It's you're, you're defining it in advance, which is an act of thought, as Hegel points out. You're defining it as nothing and therefore it is just nothing. And he basically points out that, okay, yes, these concepts that we use to make sense of the world, they are concepts that, you know, time and space, that is a product of thought. Um, but he also points out it doesn't follow from that, that the objects themselves do not also have these qualities. And of course, that is the case. So while it's true that we don't experience, I suppose, time 
in general, we don't experience tableness. We only experience specific tables. Um, these specific objects do and must have uh, general qualities uh, that relate them to other things, such as hardness or softness. Um, and by experiencing not one table, uh, but many, many tables in our lives, then we begin to uh, we begin to form generalizations, which kind of link all of those related objects together and express their real relations more or less accurately. Obviously, it's possible for ideas to be wrong, but essentially that is what is going on. So what human Kant couldn't grasp was that these generalizations, are not, yes, they're not found in any one experience of any one table. They are summation of the experience of many, many things over a long period of time. And therefore, again, I think we can see the limitation of idealism basing itself on, on this very atomistic outlook that uh, breaking down experience into just the experience of one individual at one moment in time, rather than seeing the, the process, which is of course a dialectical uh, outlook and we'll come on to dialectical thinking in later weeks. Um, anyway, so that really answers that point of view. Um, just to go on to some other problems of idealism and, and, and the criticisms that we would make as materialists of it. Um, Hume also pointed out that, um, again, perception is different than, than the objects themselves. He gave the example again of a table and he said that um, if I come, if I move further away from a table, my perception of it is that it is smaller. But obviously the table has not actually become any smaller. So perception is fundamentally different from the object itself. Now, this is really a bit of a silly uh, objection. It's very easy for a materialist to answer. The perception we have of an object is not the same as the object. The perception expresses the relationship between the object and myself, and of course, the other objects that are around it. Um, so yes, it, it looks smaller to me because it is smaller. It is, is in relation to many more things because I've moved away from it. So it has to be perceived as smaller. So that is not a, a false perception, so to speak. It just it accurately expresses a different relationship between myself and the table. So I think that was very easily answered. Um, and a problem, and in fact, the fundamental problem that idealism has from a philosophical point of view uh, is that it is kind of empty, really, ultimately. Uh, for example, uh, Berkeley, when he's discussing his ideas, he he has to reckon with the fact that obviously um, his idealism, uh, his subjective idealism or immaterialism as he called it, in which the individual's perception is all that really exists and the, the independent object does not exist. He has to explain why our ideas agree with one another, why we all agree that this table looks like this. And he says, well, the reason for that is that there's another mind outside of ours yours or mine, which is God. And God is also a mind like my, mine, but is far more powerful. And uh, God perceives these things. So God kind of gives an objective kind of quality to the perception, which everybody has to agree with. So it's not just subjective. Um, and I think you can see from that the redundancy of, of his idealism. In fact, there's one point where he says, don't worry about this idealism. Like it doesn't mean you have to abandon your, your sort of conception of things. It doesn't make any practical difference to you in your real life. And that, that really is its condemnation. It doesn't actually add anything to our understanding of anything. It's devoid of content and it has to reintroduce objectivity such as God, an objective mind outside of your own mind to make sense of the fact that we all agree about certain things. Um, Another example is Fichte, who was a, a German idealist, again, a subjective idealist. All that really exists for him is the individual ego, which, as he puts it, posits itself. In other words, you make yourself, you create yourself. Um, and uh, he has to reckon with the fact that we have unexpected experiences that we face, that we're aware of our own limitations, right? That we don't feel limitless and like we can do anything. Um, and so he, he, he basically says that the mind limits itself defines itself as limited in order to kind of make it, I don't know, make sense or something. So it's again, it's like he, 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 he starts out from the assumption of the isolated individual and then realises that, of course, this would be absurd because if you were an isolated individual, you would not le leave your life in the way that you do. So therefore, he says, well, actually, your own mind kind of creates a, a, an objective limitation for itself. So he has to reintroduce objectivity after the fact. Um, so we see that idealism kind of becomes uh, 
like devoid of explanatory power, um, devoid of content, really, as to use a famous phrase, a ghost in a machine. It doesn't add anything to the explanation. You know, if if the soul or consciousness is totally immaterial and has nothing to do with the material, why does it inhabit my body? Why does it make my body move in the ways that it does? It's something that they cannot explain in any way. They can just say, well, it does and it's a mystery or something, or they can deny that the material body exists. That's not really adding anything to our understanding. It's not, certainly not very helpful. And in fact, I would say that at the, at the end of the day, the idealists are condemned by the contradiction between their own ideas and their practice. And as Marx pointed out, it is pra real human practice that is actually what defines us in the end. Um, it hasn't added anything. And any idealist, even the most extreme subjective idealist philosopher, leads their life just like anyone else. They eat food, they don't run out into the street, etc. Obviously, they don't really believe what they say. They believe it in a sort of very abstract theoretical sense, but in their practical life, it has no application whatsoever. And therefore they disprove it in sort of every moment of their existence. Therefore it's an outlook which quite obviously reflects the social position of philosophers and in, you know bourgeois intellectuals basically who are removed to, from the day-to-day -day struggles of the real world and who can afford to put forward ideas that are fundamentally useless. Although there is a use for these ideas, of course, um, which is to serve reactionary causes by obscuring the real struggles that people go through, uh, the real most profound truths of society, that is the class struggle, the poverty, you know, the real human experience that the vast majority of people go to. By defining human experience as removed from all of those things, uh, and, and defining it as just some sort of abstract in, individual, they have made philosophy um, kind of a barrier against socialism, a barrier against human liberation. Um, and I think that as, as we explained at the end of the last episode, you know, idealism still exists. Not only does it exist, it's arguably still the dominant school of thought, in, in, at least in, in philosophy. Um, and that's a very peculiar thing in this era of science until you realise that we still live in a class society, in a society in which a small minority is incredibly rich and powerful, uh, that wants to obscure the realities of our society. You know, a society that wants to maintain, or, or sorry, a ruling class that wants to maintain a society of alienation, of poverty, of lack of control over our own lives, of insecurity, essentially. And so long as we live in a society in which humans exploit other humans, and people lead lives of deep insecurity, and uncertainty, then I think idealism will still always exist as a philosophy that uh, of the privileged, essentially, which which deliberate, which justifies in one way way or another uh, capitalism and all of its inequality. So the fight against idealism, once again, is ultimately, of course, we have to be able to answer its ideas, but it is ultimately a, re a social and a political struggle against capitalism.